kitten came in, jumped in a tar bucket, and then apparently hit, got around some stone. I have to tell you, we actually looked at this and went, oh my gosh, what the heck are we gonna do? I mean, I was on the website Googling, how do you get you know, royal grease, whatever, off the kitten? Um, but we did, took a lot of time, took a lot of patience. The kitten needed some pain meds and stuff to, and, and sedated a little bit, because it was a little bit freaked out. And as you pulled the oil off, its skin would rip a little bit too, so it needed the pain meds for that. Um, I, and the other thing that I think is interesting is someone heard we actually shaved the cat too to get some of the oil. We actually got a complaint. <laughs> I, I, it amazes me what people will complain. I can't believe you shaved the cat. Don't you know you're never supposed to shave the cat? I'm like, okay, you tell that little kitten. <laughs> and the little kitten was fine. <laughs> And the little kitten was fine and actually got adopted by a board member from Service Dogs of Virginia and sort of ruled the roost over there. <laughs> um, we also now offer, we, do, we now do spay and neuter every animal before adoption and we offer a subsidized service to the public. Um, because of grants, we also offer some free spay and neuter service. This is because of the uh, PetSmart Charities grant is that they're doing uh, targeted uh, to areas where you have to actually collect the data to get it. So you have to look at your intake and what areas you're taking the most amount of intake from. So that data is very important in this process. And we've always done uh, free spay neuter for pit bulls. But this is why I said, spay neuter is absolutely important. I find this chart very interesting because this is the number, the top chart, chart is the number of spay neuter surgeries we're doing. Well, we were generally between about 4,500 in the one year we hit 6,000, but look at expenses in the year that we hit 6,000. There seems to be a pretty good correlation between the number of surgeries we're doing and the expense side. So I'm not saying don't do spay neuters at all. Please don't ever take that away. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is you got to do the easy stuff too. The adoptions, the foster care, the marketing, you can do very cheaply while you're still doing this. Our goal for 2011 is 7,000 surgeries. We did 4,970 last year, so that's because now we've done all of our other programs. Um, since we've done all of our other programs, now we're really focused on really hitting the spay neuter hard, and we got some grants to do that, which is why we're focused on that. Um, our intake is finally starting to come down. What was very interesting, and I think if anyone goes down this path, and most people I talk to, you'll, you'll hear probably a similar story, but we saw our intake go up once we decided and let everyone know that we were going, that we had a goal to go no kill, because before that no one wanted to bring us the kittens. <laughs> After they said, oh, now the kittens are safe, now we're gonna bring them in there, we did see our intake go up. We did probably see people dropping them off from other shelters that were located around in our, our box and stuff. You know what, at the end of the day, deal with it. Happens. Doesn't mean you stop doing what you wanna do, you just keep moving forward and deal with it. The interesting thing is the reasons our intake is going down, does everyone think it's spay neuter? It's actually not. If we look at our reasons right now, some of it is spay neuter. But it's because number one, we've been working with our animal control officers and actually all the animals come to us but animal control doesn't report to us. So we don't have any control. And at first when we went down this path, um, I wasn't really well liked by the staff or animal control officers. When they said I was naive, you'll never get to no kill, you don't know what you're doing, you don't have any experience, we know better. Um, now we actually we work very well together and we got them to work with us and stop to stop bringing in all the feral cats and let us go out there and try to help the situation and do more on the TNR side. So animal control has stopped bringing in a lot of the feral cats and, and we were somewhat opportunistic because we took advantage of the fact that the City and the county were reducing their budgets. And at the time, it's not that way now, but at the time they were paying us on a per animal basis. So we went to their sergeant and said, hey, you want to save money? Stop bringing in the feral cat. And he was like calculating it going, hey, that's really a good way to, for me to meet my budget. Um, and so instead now we work together and we send out people to try to uh, spay neuter the feral cats instead of them coming in to us. The other reason it goes down is surrender counseling. Um, we are open admission, but it doesn't mean we're not going to work with people and try to keep an animal in their home. So at the end of the day, we will always take things in when we have to. But if we can work with them, they're, they're surrendering an animal from a, for a behavior problem. 
If we can help them keep their animal, we're going to do that. And we've been very successful. You can probably keep at least a third, maybe more of your animals uh, ever coming in, from ever coming in, by just working with people and helping them keep their animals. So that's just sort of our save rate. The red, bar, the blue's our save rate for the last five years. We're over, we're about 92% this year. Um, and the red is for the Commonwealth of Virginia. So it's not because, oh, well, we can't do that. Virginia is different than Michigan. It's not, all of Virginia isn't doing this yet either, but hopefully working towards it too. Um, and, but anyone, we're no different. It's not like our community is like, has the best situation. There's a lot of communities around us that have a lot more money, that have taken less animals, and should be doing a heck of a lot better than us that aren't. So it's really, I, I get back to attitude. Um, we've been recognized for our efforts, and that's all good. But really, why I think it's great is it creates a sense of community pride. Our community is really proud to be part of a community that doesn't euthanize healthy, treatable animals. You know, we get the word out, and that helps from a fundraising side. And it helps by people wanting to come in for your facility and wanting to help you. So we, our community, is very, very proud of the organization and they're part of it. Everyone's part of this, this community effort. Because of that, you know, I actually, yeah, I'll take a, you know, because really animals and people together, I think that's your message, bring them together, this is all, it's not just about the animals. You actually have to be concerned about people because people are going to help you. You can't hate the public, they're not the problem. They're the, they're the resource out there to help you get there. Does, can you see who this is? Sissy Spacek. Sissy Spacek works or lives in our community. Um, and she lived there for a while and hasn't necessarily been involved. But again, it's that, that's that community pride. You know, she came in, learned about what we were doing, how successful it was, you know, that, that we all, I mean, she said you can even see it when you're there, that everyone is really so focused about saving lives. She became a board member. And then afterwards, um, you know, she was sort of, and she's not, she doesn't go to every board meeting or anything, but, um, but I said, well, can we do a commercial? And this, this goes along, you know, what we were talking about earlier, keep it positive. She's like, well, you know what? I would be involved in a commercial if it wasn't for the, you know, all the animals are, everyone's cruelty, everyone's cruelly treated or come in and adopt them, they're gonna die. And, like, I don't want to be involved in anything negative. I want to be involved in a great, uplifting commercial. And if you're willing to do that, I'm willing to help out and put, you know, put my name on it too. Not only did she put her name on it, but her daughter's a singer-songwriter. Her name is Skylar Fisk, and she's like, let me call up Skylar, see if she's got a song. And um, Skylar had a great, uplifting song that went along, and so this was the commercial that we did together with Sissy and Skylar. I think this could be a good thing If you're in the right place Just the right time Your heart won't have to wander No, it won't need any other You can say Here with me yeah. Always look a little bit of dark sky sunny Everything is better when you love somebody, especially when that somebody is an animal in need. You can make a difference, so please, donate, adopt, or volunteer to the Charlottesville Abermoral SPCA. See, we use that kitten, puppy, or dog picture all the time. So again, didn't cost us a penny. The city of Charlottesville actually gave us their production people because actually if you go to someone and say, hey, I want to do a commercial with Sissy Spacek, everyone wants to come. Um, and, and you know, and this, this words of the songs are always, you know, the way to make my dark sky sunny. Everything's better when you love somebody. Everything's upbeat and we use that a lot in our messaging and everything else. So, but this wouldn't, I mean, she's lived there. This is, wasn't going to happen until we changed the way that we did things and people were proud about what we did. So at the end of the day, remember, 
It's about a no-kill community. It's not about a no-kill shelter. It's not about telling everyone else what they should do. It's becoming part of the solution yourself. Um, and it's everyone working together. I think everyone has to help. And a lot of times people will say something to me about, well, what if you weren't there or whatever? I said, no, it's not me. Uh, is Suzanne Kogut is not what made the SPC, the Charlotte Almiral community, no kill. It's about getting, I may have been the person to bring people together, but it's about getting the community to work together to do this. Because I can't save all the animals myself. I know that. This is about getting good people around that want to do the things and getting them motivated to do it. Stay positive. Solutions, not excuses. It is a waste of time and energy to talk about what you can't do. I mean, don't use, don't wait, it's a waste of your breath. You can do something. Um, uh, we, have, we always have staff resolutions that we try to get everyone to buy into, and in 2010 we tried like, you know, like the, the uh, David Letterman top 10 list, so we had our top 10 resolutions, and there were too many, and everyone kept forgetting what they were, and we couldn't keep on track, and we can't remember 10 things. We've learned that. So to 2011, our resolution is to do our part. All of our staff members, all of our volunteers, everyone that's around, we all want to do our part. And P is for staying positive. A is for accountability. This isn't about what anyone, but you know, we need to be accountable. So we've had, we, I'll give you an example. We had a poor, um, our adoptions for March were not what we wanted them to be. So we don't sit there and go, shoot, no one's coming in to adopt, what are we going to do, can't believe no one's coming in, why aren't they coming in? Accountability is by saying, what did we do wrong, and what can we do differently to increase adoptions? It doesn't happen to you, you make it happen. That's what accountability is. R is for respect, we have to respect one another, we have to treat each other with respect on a daily basis, because we all have to do what T is, and that's work together as a team, it's teamwork. So positive, accountability, respect, and teamwork. And so our organization says every day, and we have little signs all over, you know, that has the P positive, and we put them all over the SPCA. And so we all want to do our part this year. And to do your part, this means everyone. This isn't about what anyone else should do. It's about what we all should do together. Everyone has responsibility in this. Because we started this off talking about it's all about attitude. And it really, really is. Maybe your organization has very little resources and takes in a lot of animals. Maybe you don't get there in a year and a half. But you can do something to improve it. And if you're not focused on improving it, then you, I, I guarantee you, you won't succeed. So it's Winston Churchill. Attitude is a little thing that makes a big difference. And Rochelle up here is a little thing. She was, she didn't look this good, actually. This was after she was grown, but she came to us. She looked like heck. She was a, I don't know, four to five months old Shih Tzu puppy that had been hit by a car. Her owners weren't going to care for her. Someone brought her in. She came in with a stick hanging out her back, and it was lodged into her spinal cord. And we did everything we could, and at the end of the day, she was going to be paralyzed from the hips down. So we all sat around and said, what do we do? Is it the best thing to do to euthanize her? And she have a good quality of life. But every time you open the cage, this little dog like ran up to you, was so happy, and it was the big debate. You know, what is the right thing? We didn't, we didn't want to euthanize her. Was it the right thing for her? I said, well, let me take her home. She just seemed so happy with life. Now remember, and, and this is at the time, she came home with me. So here we have, we've got a four to five months old, old paralyzed Shih Tzu puppy going to a home with two pit bulls, <laughs> one chow, and two sort of collie mixes. And by all measures, she should be at the bottom of the total pole of that chain of command, correct? <laughs> Mix. 
example of how her attitude is everything. She doesn't have what those dogs have around her. She doesn't have their size. She can't walk, but she took over my household, and she was a boss of my household from the minute I put her down on the ground. And she did, um, she did find her own home. Um, and the woman, she has her dressed up. She lives in, she has her own wheels. She lives in a household with other disabled, smaller dogs, but she has still taken charge of that household too. <laughs> so, um, really, everyone can do something. If I leave you with anything, please just do, if you can't do everything, do something. You can move forward and try to get there quickly because really the animals are depending on you. Thank you guys very much. <laughs> we have time for some questions. Any questions? Um, it's not my job to worry about them falling, every, every individual falling in the law. Now, you know, and I, it, I, I'm not going to go and look at how many animals everyone has in their household. We're, we're not. I mean, we don't do home visits on every animal, too. Um, but, you know, I, I really, I don't really think you have to to make sure you have a right home, a good home. Yeah, you know, and the other thing I can say on uh, uh, one one other thing is, uh, you know, when you get into the adoption side, it's sort of similar to like your adoption policies. Don't be fearful about returns. I mean, some people are so fearful about returns that they fail to adopt out anything or just a very small percentage. We, I don't think returns are bad, actually, and I'm gonna tell you why. Number one, and this is what, we actually tell them in our adoption contract that if they're not happy to return the animal to us. And when they do, what are we? We're bad. I mean, they, oh my gosh, you know, and everyone wants to have this attitude about being so mad. They actually did what we asked them to do. How can we be mad at them? Number two, we all know that not all the animals act the same in the facility as they do when they get in a home. So if someone came in looking for a couch potato, and that dog was a couch potato in your facility, and they took it home, and they just really didn't have the activity level for that high energy dog, take it in, say thank you, find out more information that's gonna help you find a better home next time, and make another match. Don't be, they're not a bad home because they didn't, that wasn't a good match for them. Don't hate them and don't prevent them from adopting and put them on a DNA list and send it out to everyone in the community. Oh, horrible people, they didn't give the animal a chance. It may have just not been a good fit and that's okay. Learn more information, put it in a better home next time and you may actually want to adopt out again. Um, our return percentage, is, it's 8% and it hasn't changed since we changed our adoption sense, um, policy. So our judgmental returns have not been any difference between, since when we became less judgmental. Anything else? I can't, I actually don't have glasses, so if you're in the back, you'll have to stand up if anyone has anything. So I don't have my glasses on. No? Okay, go ahead. Do you screen your foster homes in some way? We initially had um, a couple of volunteers that did home visits on every foster home, um, and we were, they were coming in fast and furiously too. What we do, we just do an interview, and I mean, if, you, if anyone ever feels with an adoption or a foster interview that they feel uncomfortable, we always have the right to go do a home visit, but we don't do it on everything. We'll have a quick interview, we have a foster home application, um, and a lot of times, you know, I mean that family with the, the cute little girls that came in and they just wanted some kittens for a little bit. Yeah, we talked to them for a little bit and then we gave them some kittens. And get them, get them out that day if you have them. Don't tell them to come back. Oh, thanks for your application. We'll call you. And then you can play telephone tag for about two weeks. And then maybe they'll come back or maybe they've lost the enthusiasm. I don't mean to sound like a used car salesman, but if they want kittens and they're ready to take them home, give them kittens. We don't deny adoptions a lot. We often try to find 
a different match. So if someone comes in and they want um, an outdoor dog only, and they want this little puppy or this animal that's been in a foster home and it really wants to be an indoor dog, we will deny that adoption. We'll say, and we won't say it when we deny it, we won't deny it. What we'll say is, hey, that's really not, that, that dog is not gonna make a good out outdoor dog. But we had, like one time we had a chow. She hated being inside. She was adopted into a, um, a home that was an apartment and sat there and panted by the door 24 seven. Um, she wanted to be outside most of the time. We have some hounds that have, are really typically hunting dogs and hate being inside. So we try to encourage and say, okay, fine, can we find you one? But they, of course, obviously have to have shelter, bring it in in extreme temperatures and different things like that. And we'll likely do a home visit. Um, so most of the time we're finding, here's the thing is, I don't think a lot of people come into our SPCA because they want to truly treat animals. You know, they may be not as educated about a proper care for animals as we would like them to be, and that's our job to help educate them. Um, so that's what we try to do, and then find them an animal that's a good match for their household. If someone wants a kitten or a cat that's gonna be outside all the time, we have barn cats, and we have barn cat room, and we'll give them a, a barn cat to take if they want a mouse or. It really depends on the foster home. So, and if a foster home wants to approve applications, we'll let them approve applications. So it really depends, and some of them don't want to talk to people, they just want to take care of the animals, bring them in and let them get adopted. Other people want to know who their animals are going to or who their fosters will allow them to do that. Um, we've had people deny adopters for a, like say they have a puppy and they didn't want to adopt them. And that they'll call us up, well they didn't adopt it, and we'll just simply say, you know what, they weren't saying you were a bad person. They'll be a good adopter. They, they just said it wasn't a good match for that puppy. Why don't you come in, we have other puppies here, and, and get one of those puppies. If, if we go to, the, we'll do outside adoption events. We used to do more than we do now because we've been so good that people know where we are, and they always come to us. So we tend to be more successful now at our facility, but right now we're having, we've got more hounds, and so we'll, we'll do some adoption events with hounds. Um, we actually had a program that we called the PERM, the URR, Perfect Partnerships, that we did with local businesses, and anyone that wanted to put a cage of cats or kittens in their local business, it could be an antique store, um, and then we would give them, you know, some publicity, because we have different radio spots that we have for free, and we can say, oh, and if you're looking for a kitten, not only come to the SPCA, but go to these businesses, and then the businesses would be happy because we did publicity for them and stuff. So, you know, we'll do things like that too. You know, it's not as, um, pro that's probably one of the areas that we're not as developed as we'd like to be. I think the Nevada Humane Society has a better program than we do. But we're basically, we're gonna listen to what their issues are and if someone that at our facility can help them, we will. And if not, we've got some relationships with some of the dog trainers in the area. The cat issues, mostly we have someone on staff that could help. Um, and so it's really, it, it becomes part of the, I'm calling to surrender my animal, and it's a matter of finding out information. I don't think there's anything wrong, and I know someone's gonna say, well, we do, but I don't think there's anything wrong with asking someone to make an appointment to surrender their animal. I don't get to get up in the morning and say, hey, I wanna go to the doctors, and I want you to examine me right this minute. You know, so we actually ask people to make appointments. We have information that we need to know. We want them to fill something out, I don't, so this gives us the information that we need to help them keep the animal. It's, you know, and you will have crazy things as far as surrenders. We had one woman that wanted, we had a new front desk staff manager, and this was just recently, and there was a woman that came in and she wanted to surrender her two dogs. One was a 10-year-old hound. I mean, again, last thing you want to be in our facility is a 10-year-old hound. And she's bawling her eyeballs out because she's going to get evicted. And so he comes up and says, well, I, I need to take them right away, right? And I said, nope. And I, everyone will probably be surprised, right? But eviction takes 90 days. She's not getting evicted right away. 
So, you know, the threatening of, oh my gosh, and this is going to happen if you don't take them, um, takes 90 days to be evicted. I said, go back and tell her we are happy to help her. Find out information from her landlord. Let her know we're going to call her landlord and say, hey, we understand that this is going to happen. We just want you to know we're working with her. We're going to help her a little bit. And can you, you know, we just need a little bit of time to do our process, but don't evict her because we're, we're going to take in her dogs. So she's like, okay, fine. Um, she goes, well, maybe I'll call up someone I know too and see if they can take the dog. So she leaves and she's like, let me call my landlord first. She then calls us back 45 minutes later, says, thank you very much. Oh, we also told her we had behavior counseling stuff. So thank you very much. My landlord was never going to evict me. The reason she thought her landlord was going to evict her is because her neighbor, who didn't like her dogs, and she had a chihuahua, told her her landlord was going to evict her if they didn't get rid of the dogs. So now she was happy. She kept her two hands. She thanked us for offering her help in the future if she had behavior issues. And we kept two dogs out of the shelter. Now you can say, well, that took a lot of time. But it would have taken a heck of a lot more time to take care of that 10-year-old hound in our facility that was probably going to be there eight months. Maybe more. So I, you know what? I, I think that was a really good use of time. You just need to think differently about why you're doing things. Go ahead, sorry. Some do. Some do. It really, it really depends. Um, and, and just because they do doesn't mean they don't foster again. And again, if they do and they can't foster again, it's our job to find more. But um, I wouldn't say it's a huge percentage. We have a lot of our fosters, you know, we'll use um, students in the area a lot because we have UVA is around us. So students will become great fosters. Um, you know, and just other people that really don't have, people that travel a lot are great fosters or people that have one dog and, um, and they want their dog to have a playmate here and there, but they don't think they can handle two dogs, they'll come in. And a lot of times we'll give them an adopt me vest, so when they're walking the dog around the neighborhood, a lot of times they don't adopt it, but someone else seeing it. There's your outside adoption events too, that's free publicity. They'll walk them around. Last year we did the um, Pet Finder Foster for the Holidays or the year before. We had so many adoptions from that. A lot of people said, oh, you don't want to get them out of your facility because then we won't have them here to adopt. We have plenty of animals. So we got so many adoptions from people walking them around and they never got, they never were brought back in. Then. They came in, adopted them, and handed them off. Well, thank you very much for having me, and I wish you all the best of luck.